<laughs> okay. Wait for it. Wait. I still have people, Caribbean people that come up to me and tell me, thank you for, thank you for making that song for our islands, man. Uh, I don't have the heart to tell them. Yeah, I mean, I, I put NY after it, but uh, people uh, wanted to be what they wanted to be, and that's fine with me, just buy the record. <laughs> I still miss the old days. It's changed so much uh, from the time I was here. Jamaica had its own unique uh, style, its own unique uh, flavor and chemistry. Uh, just the spark that was here and that intermingling between the, you know, the older and the younger musicians here uh, was unique for this, for this town. Yeah, I think for every young jazz musician that was coming up in the 70s and 80s out of Queens, that was the spot. It's called the Village Door uh, Chinese restaurant. This was the training ground. James Brown lived down the street. Uh, Cal Basie was around the corner. You could order Egg Foo Young and be listening to Freddie Hubbard. This is all the bar originally. All along here was a bar. Uh, and at the very end of the bar was the bandstand with the keyboards and drums and so on. So it's, it's just changed completely. That song, Funky for Jamaica, has been born here. Born here. This is it. The, the background rap was just a free flow rap session, basically. Some of the stuff that came out was pretty accurate. Some of the stuff that came out was a little derogatory, but we just, it worked. They basically got high and flowed with it. Tony wrote the lyric. Uh, she came up with the melody on the lyric. And I think what, what Tony did is what, what, what pulled everybody into the song. Jamaica Avenue, and we celebrate today, Girls Like Style, baby. That's right. What was that, 76, right? There was times when we were playing concerts at that period where we'd make $20,000 a night, and we might do three, four concerts a week. Uh, I was immature enough to not know how to handle it properly, and, you know, money is a fleeing thing. If you don't handle it, it will tell itself where to go, and it did very, very promptly. It went on flying, it went on fur coats, uh, it went on Mercedes, it went on uh, a variety of things. And you know, when the hit record stopped, the money stops with it. There came a point when my music career had kind of crumbled to the ground to the point where I said, I need to make a living some other way. I went to college as a physics major and it was, my desire was to fly for a living. Uh, music was going to be my hobby. Uh, and somehow things got turned around. And I just decided to go back into aviation and uh, do that full time. This is what I flew back in 1973, but it's, uh, it's always a love, first love for me. All yours, Captain. Uh, you 
just, you just, I guess it's a left brain, right brain thing. There's a part of me that just desires the peacefulness and the structure of flying. I just love it as it's, you know, break, breaking out above the clouds in the bright sunlight. It's just a unique feeling. But then there's an the artistic side also with, with the music. And so they're just two different, two different concepts. You know, my, my job in life is to make music and provide for my family, not to make hit records. And so I've, I've kind of learned to distinguish between those two things. As long, long as I can provide for my family, I'm a happy man.